Section 18 of My Strange Rescue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley. Section 18 how wilberforce brennan visited white bear castle wilby wilby come here i want you called a woman's shrill voice at the foot of the stairs and down from the little attic room came the answer promptly all right mother i'm just coming a minute later a stout hearty lad of fifteen presented himself before his mother and dutifully awaited her commands. Why, Wilby, she said, I was just thinking I had better send you over to Aunt Matilda's to tell her that your father was going to town tomorrow. She's pretty sure to want him to do something for her, and he goes so seldom nowadays. She'll be disappointed if we don't let her know. Well, mother, replied the boy looking rather doubtfully out of the window from which a vast expanse of desolate snow-covered fields could be seen it's not just the best kind of an afternoon to be going away over to auntie's there's a heap of snow on the ground and it's awfully cold and the wind's rising tut what does a big strong boy like you care for the cold besides you could put on your snow boots and take the short cut through the wood lot you won't feel the wind in the woods i really must send aunt matilda word and father won't have time to go over himself very well mother if i must i must i suppose but all the same i wish it could wait till to-morrow so saying will be with a sign of resignation went off to get ready for his tramp it was no trifling affair this errand over to aunt matilda's i can tell you she lived a good six miles away by the road and even taking the short cut through the pasture and wood lot it was not less than four miles of course with fine weather and good going four miles was not much of a task for wilby's sturdy legs and he never failed to get so warm a welcome and such delicious cake at his aunt's that generally he was only too glad to go but in midwinter with four feet of snow on the ground the thermometer right down to zero and the wind cutting like a knife it seemed a very different matter however wilby as his mother called him for short wilberforce being kept for company or when she wanted to be very emphatic was quite as plucky as he was obedient and a quarter of an hour after his mother first called him he started out on his errand muffled up to his eyes with his snowshoes well strapped to his feet and his good dog oscar trotting along beside him it was well for him that he did have wise old oscar as we shall presently see bending his head low so as to protect his face as much as possible from the keen wind and swinging his arms to and fro in time with his stride wilby went swiftly down the hillside across the river and up the other slope until he reached the shelter of the woods where the wind bothered him no longer and he could take things more quietly oscar ran soberly along at his heels and wilby was glad of his company for the short winter day was already drawing to a close and the lonely woodlot 
was not the most cheerful place in the world to be at that time wilby was a great boy for books and had just finished reading colonel knox's delightful story the voyage of the vivian of which the most interesting part to him had been that relating to the polar bears and now as he trudged steadily along through the silent woods he fell to thinking about these bears and wondering what he should do supposing he should meet one of course he knew well enough that the nearest white bear was at least a thousand miles away and that even an ordinary black bear had not been seen in that neighborhood for years but all the same he could not get those cruel white monsters out of his thoughts in fact he became quite nervous over them and would peer eagerly ahead and anxiously around just as if one of them might rush in upon him at any minute at length his nervousness got so much the better of him that walking seemed altogether too slow and he started off on a hard run only two miles of the distance to aunt matilda's was left at this time and one of these soon disappeared as wilby hurried onward with oscar bounding joyfully beside him ten minutes more at the farthest and they would be safe at their destination already wilby thought he could catch through the trees a gleam of light from the kitchen window when suddenly something unfortunate happened it had been hard work keeping to the wood path so buried was it under the snow and he must have strayed a little from it for he found his way barred by a huge tree trunk which certainly ought not to have been there the wisest thing of course would have been to retrace his steps a bit but instead of that wilby rashly tried a running leap over the obstacle and it was not a success without snowshoes he might have cleared it easily but with these encumbrances on his feet he not only made a very poor attempt but in some way or other they got entangled together and in a violent effort to keep his balance he sprained his right ankle so badly that to his great dismay he found he could no longer bear any weight upon it here was a pretty state of affairs indeed a whole mile from aunt matilda's not yet clear of the woods not a living soul within reach of his voice his right leg utterly useless and hurting awfully and the cold growing more intense every minute it did not take poor willoughby long to realize that he was in no little danger as he could do nothing with his snowshoes he took them off and tried to get along without them but the snow was so dry and soft that he sank right into it and could make no advance at all his only hope seemed to be to shout at the top of his voice on the small chance of somebody hearing him so he called for help with all his might oscar was much puzzled by his master's conduct and circled impatiently around him as if to urge him onward for quite a long time wilby shouted until what between cold and weariness there was no more shout left in him presently he felt an intense longing to sleep stealing over him he strove desperately hard to shake it off for he knew well what it meant but in spite of all his efforts the deadly drowsiness crept steadily and surely over his senses and he was just 
lapsing into unconsciousness when there was a crashing in the underbrush ahead and before he had time to ask himself what it could be the small trees in front of him parted violently and out stepped a great white bear what do you mean by all this shouting he demanded rather crossly curiously enough wilby was not quite so terrified as he expected he would be if a white bear happened along and found courage to say very humbly please mr bear i hope i didn't disturb you but you see i've sprained my ankle badly and i was shouting for someone to come and help me ho ho you are hurt are you was the reply in rather a gentler tone well i'll look after you and so saying the bear picked the boy up in his arms as though he had been a little baby and marched off with him through the woods at a rapid rate wilby knew resistance was vain so he just made up his mind to take things as quietly as possible which under the circumstances was a very wise thing to do after about five minutes walking his captor came to a large tree which had been torn up by the roots under this he quickly dodged and entered what seemed to be a long dark passage in spite of his good resolution wilby could not help a kind of groan at this shut up growled the bear giving him a by no means gentle cuff on the side of the head wilby did shut up and for a time nothing was to be heard save the soft thump 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 of the bear's broad feet on the hard floor of the passage at last they stopped the bear gave something of a kick a door flew open inward and then there burst upon the bewildered wilby such a sight as he had never even dreamed of in his life before he found himself in a large room flooded with light and warmth from a glorious wood fire that was crackling away in a huge fireplace at one end at first he thought the whole place had just been newly whitewashed but soon discovered his mistake everything in and about that room was marble white marble pure and glistening as the snow outside floor walls ceiling tables they were all marble alike and they looked wonderfully fine with the firelight flashing upon them but before wilby had time to take much more in he heard a deep bass voice asking hello major what have you got there and turning his head he saw a splendid white bear a good deal bigger than his rescuer coming toward them from the far end of the room some farmer's son max answered the major at the same time gently depositing his load on a couch near the fire i found him most frozen to death in a snowdrift i guess we can make him all right again of course we can exclaimed another voice much livelier in tone than the first speaker's and a third bear quite as white but not so tall as either of the others emerged into the firelight from a dark corner where he had been attending to some household duty of course we can if you say so minor growled the one called max good-humouredly we'll begin by giving him a good dinner at all events by the way i forgot to mention that the full names of wilby's new friends were ursa minor 
Ursa Major and Ursa Maximus, but for convenience sake they call one another simply Minor, Major, and Max. Feeling surprisingly at ease in view of his strange surroundings, Wilby stretched himself out on his comfortable couch and almost forgot the pain from his sprained ankle in his delight at his novel experience. What a lot I'll have to tell them at home, he said exultingly to himself. They won't believe one half of it, I know. Maximus was evidently head of the household and superintended in a dignified way, while Major and Minor bustled about getting dinner ready. In a little while, all the preparations were complete, and Major, who seemed to feel especially responsible for Wilby, brought him a steaming bowl of something which the hungry boy was not long in sampling. And it proved to be such delicious rabbit stew that he could not help exclaiming, My sakes, but this is fine! Mother couldn't make a better stew herself! Which compliment pleased Minor, who had prepared the stew, so much that he filled Wilby's bowl up again, before it was fairly empty. Besides the stew, there were roast partridges and baked potatoes, and also apples and nuts, so that Wilby had just about as much as he could comfortably eat, in fact, perhaps a little more. At all events, his waistband began to remind him it was there. Dinner over, the dishes were cleared away, and the room set in order again. We'll be watching everything with the liveliest interest, determined to have such a story to tell as would make him the hero of the countryside for a whole month, at least. He was particularly struck with the deftness with which the bears went about their work, although their big paws looked clumsy enough, the deer knows they did things as handily as Wilby himself could have done them. When every sign of the dinner had vanished, Max, Major, and Minor drew up their chairs, for they each had a big armchair, in front of the fire, and sat down to talk over the events of the day quite ignoring the addition to their family, who, indeed, was very well pleased at being left alone, as he much preferred using his eyes to his tongue when everything around him was so delightfully novel. The bear's voices were so low and deep that Willie could not make out one half they were saying. Besides, what with the warmth of the room and his own weariness, he began to feel very sleepy again, especially as the couch was extremely comfortable. In fact, he had just about dozed off when he was awakened by Maximus jumping up from his chair and saying in a loud tone, Come, fellows, let us have a song and then we'll turn in. Whereupon the three of them stood up together around the fire and sang very heartily the following song, the words of which, so far as he heard them, Wilby had no difficulty in remembering, although the tune went completely out of his head. He had not much of an ear for music, anyway. Three jolly white bears are we, who can sing right merrily, for our hearts are light and free from any care. We have always lots to eat, and we keep our house so neat that it's really quite a treat to be a bear. Yes, indeed, we're happy bears, 
since nobody knows our lairs where we mind our own affairs so quietly of course we have to work but none of us ever shirk for who'd be a lazy lark don't you see when the snow is on the ground we go hunting all around for the bunnies which abound among the trees and when summer time is here how the berries disappear down our throats but wilby never heard the end of the third verse for the simple reason that sleep overcame him just then and song singers and marble palace alike faded away into nothingness he had no idea how long he slept but when he awoke he was both surprised and disappointed to find himself on the sofa in aunt matilda's very plain though cosy sitting-room instead of on his couch in the white bear castle while now not only his ankle but his whole body gave him pain every nerve tingling and face and hands smarting dreadfully minor major and maximus were all gone too and in their place dear old aunt matilda and kind uncle lemuel were bending over him with faces full of relief at his return to consciousness oh will be dear how glad i am to see you open your eyes again exclaimed aunt matilda joyfully you were so long coming too that i began to fear that it might be all over with you yes will be my boy added uncle lemuel you've had a close shave but for oscar there would be not much life left in you by this time Wilby was too dazed for some time to understand it all but later on his uncle explained the matter it seemed that wise old oscar as soon as Wilby lost his senses scampered off to uncle lemuel's as hard as he could go and by barking and scratching at the door soon let them know he was there then by means whose meaning they were not long in guessing he persuaded them to go back with him until poor wilby was found where he had fallen behind the big tree oscar capered about wild with delight when his master was carried off to the house and uncle lem could not say enough about his cleverness wilby felt very grateful to oscar and to his uncle also and thankful that he had not lost his life yet he could not help a twinge of regret at the thought of never seeing his white bear friends again seeing how kindly they had treated him in spite of their character for cruelty however it was no small consolation to have such a rattling good story to tell and tell it he did very graphically many a time much to the enjoyment of his hearers whether they all believed it or not is a question that if you do not mind i will leave it to you to settle end of section eighteen section nineteen of my strange rescue this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by shasta oakland california my strange rescue by james macdonald oxley section nineteen outside the boom mort henshaw was a boy who had implicit faith in himself he cherished the firm conviction that whatever any other boy could do 
came within the range of his capabilities he had only to find out the way it should be done in order to accomplish it this was a pretty large view to take of things in general yet it must be confessed that mort was not without a fair degree of justification for having what the scotch would call so good a conceit of himself blessed with a strong symmetrical frame a quick eye a sure hand a perfect constitution and abundant courage he came easily by a mastery of the different sports he entered into and had few equals and fewer superiors at cricket football lacrosse baseball swimming rowing and the other amusements of the day there was one pastime however of which although he had heard much he knew nothing and that was sailing the pretty little stream which ran by his home afforded no facilities for this glorious sport and the pleasures of it he knew about only from the descriptions of his more fortunate companions great then was his delight when the spring that found him fifteen years of age brought with it an invitation from one of his uncles to spend the whole summer with him at his cottage on lake duchens a splendid sheet of water not far from the city of ottawa the invitation mentioned as one of the attractions of the place that he would be able to have all the sailing his heart could wish hurrah hurrah shouted mort capering about the room with a face beaming like the sun all the sailing i want just think of it won't that be grand the very thing i've been looking for it will be grand mort dear said his mother provided you take good care not to run any unnecessary risks you must do exactly what your uncle tells you just as if he were your father oh yes mother i'll do that quickly responded mort ready to promise anything in the exuberance of his joy i'll be his crew you know and obey orders just as if i were at sea with him very impatiently did mort await the coming of the day when he should set forth for duchesne's his uncle was principal at the collegiate institute of ottawa and had three months vacation which he usually spent at the lake in sailing rowing bathing and fishing until the return of autumn recalled him to his duties it was the last week in june when mort arrived at lake deschaines and his first question after exchanging greetings with his uncle and aunt was will you show me your boat please uncle smiling at his eagerness mr turner took him over to the boathouse where a number of boats and canoes lay upon the floor or were suspended upon racks against the wall mort had never seen so many or such fine boats in his life before they were nearly all built of cedar and were varnished instead of being painted the copper fastenings dotting their shining sides with regular lines the boy gave a great gasp of admiration and it was some time before he recovered himself sufficiently to ask and which is your boat uncle mr turner pointed to one lying just in front of them oh what a beauty cried mort she's the best of them all his uncle smiled a complacent assent for that was precisely his own opinion as to beauty of lines perfection of finish completeness of outfit and speed on any tack he considered the gleam 
without a superior on lake deschenes and mort's prompt recognition of the fact pleased him as much as the cordial praise of her baby does a young mother you are not far from right my boy he said the gleam is both a beauty to look at and a good one to go as you shall see for yourself very soon the gleam belonged to the class of boat known as the st lawrence skiff the swiftest and safest boats of their size when not over canvassed that carry sails she was about twenty-two feet long and had a half-deck all around with a six-inch combing to keep out the water two tall masts carried big bat-wing sails which would have soon toppled her over but for the heavy iron centerboard that kept her stiff in an ordinary breeze everything about her was of the best and mort thought her the most beautiful objects his eyes ever beheld that afternoon he had his first sail in the gleam and as responding perfectly to every puff of the wind and turn of the tiller she went flying across the lake his heart thrilled with delight and became filled with a passionate desire to master the art of handling such a craft oh uncle won't you teach me how to steer and to manage the sails before i go back home he pleaded looking earnestly into mr turner's face certainly mort certainly was the kindly reply and i think you ought to make a very apt pupil too mr turner was altogether as good as his word he took much pains in initiating mort into the mysteries of sailing teaching him the way to tack when it was permissible to jibe how to run before the wind and so forth until by the end of the first month mort had become tolerably proficient and could be trusted to manage the gleam alone in an ordinary breeze this special privilege he was then allowed to exercise provided he did not go outside the boom that is the long line of shackled logs which enclosed the bay where the boathouse stood and which was intended to keep the saw logs from stranding on the beach inside the boom was the stretch of shallow water nearly a mile long by a quarter of a mile wide on which plenty of sailing might be had without going out through the gap into the body of the lake for a time mort was content with this enclosed space and whenever his uncle permitted him would get the boat out and go tacking up and down from end to end feeling almost as proud of his newly acquired skill as if he had been the discoverer of the science of sailing but of course it was not many days before he began to cast longing eyes beyond the line of swaying logs and to feel that the thing he most desired in the world was to be allowed to sail the gleam across the lake and back but when he hinted as much to his uncle he met with no encouragement no no mort you must be content with staying inside the boom for besides the chance of a squall there is the danger of being caught in the current and carried into the rapids which would soon make an end of both you and the boat now it happened that one morning both mr and mrs turner had to go into the city not to return until by the night train and mort was left entirely to his own resources of course he turned to the gleam for company and as soon as the morning breeze came up 
taking with him two other lads about his own age he launched the boat and went skimming from end to end of the bay this is good fun said ted day but it would be better still outside the boom oh yes cried charlie lister do go outside just a little bit mort mort shook his head and tried to look very decided his own heart was beating a lively response to the suggestions of his companion but his answer was no charlie uncle does not allow me to go outside you know once the idea had been mooted however it refused to go to rest again the morning seemed a perfect one there was a steady breeze from the northwest just the direction best suited for a slant across the lake and back without having to tack at all ted and charlie begged and coaxed mort to make one trip out anyway mr turner would never know anything about it and they could easily be back before midday mort's resolution which had been rapidly weakening finally gave way altogether all right said he allowing a sudden spirit of reckless ambition to submerge his compunctions at doing what he knew well enough was a mean betrayal of his uncle's confidence in him we'll just make one trip across it does seem a pity to lose the chance this glorious morning so out through the gap the gleam darted as if glad of her freedom and went flying over the blue water toward blueberry point my but this is grand exclaimed charlie rapturously as the boat careened before the freshening breeze so that the water lapped the lee combing you're right it is a eh, mort echoed ted turning to mort who holding the tiller in one hand and the end of the main sheet in the other watched every move of the boat with feelings strangely divided between anxiety and proud delight the passage across was quickly made and then being thirsty charlie proposed that they land for a few minutes to get a drink at a spring near the shore after the drink ted suggested a bathe and thus an hour slipped by during which an ominous change took place in the weather the sky clouded over the wind which had been steady began to come in fitful gusts i don't like the looks of things said mort in a tone of concern i wish we were inside the boom well let's hurry and get there as quickly as we can responded ted it was all well enough to say this but with the change of weather had come a change of wind which was now against them so that they would have to tack all the way home by dint of careful sailing they had got about a third of the distance when suddenly the sky darkened some large drops of rain pattered upon them and the next moment a sharp squall struck the gleam full upon her quarter in order to give his whole attention to the steering mort had asked charlie to hold the main sheet impressing upon him to take only one turn around the cleat but charlie who was of the lazy sort finding the sheet hard to hold had taken two turns and done it in such a way that the rope had jammed consequently when mort shouted to him as he put the tiller hard aport let go the main sheet instantly charlie and he attempted to obey the order he could not do so in time to meet the emergency and the next instant amid simultaneous shrieks from all three boys the gleam went over on her beam ends fortunately they were all good swimmers 
and did not get entangled in any of the ropes so that without much difficulty they succeeded in climbing up on the side of the boat where it was easy enough to hold on for a while there was no fear of the gleam sinking as she bore no ballast to carry her down and had air-tight compartments in both bow and stern nevertheless the position of the boys was one of great peril for the boat was right in the channel leading to the rapids at the lower end of the lake in the direction of which the wind was now blowing to get into these rapids meant utter destruction for both boys and boat yet to keep out of them was impossible without help while to swim ashore was far beyond their powers they shouted and shrieked for aid but there was no one in sight to hear them and soon the storm burst upon them in full fury blotting out the shore on both sides and threatening to beat them off the boat as it tossed up and down in the white caps how bitterly mort regretted having ventured beyond the boom and how fervently he vowed never to do so again if he could only be saved this time when the squall passed and the air cleared he saw that they were fast drawing near the rapids oh charlie he groaned why did you make me go outside the boom charlie made no reply he could think of nothing else but his imminent danger steadily and surely the gleam drifted downward in another fifteen minutes she would be in the remorseless grasp of the rapids the wind went down almost to a calm but the current grew stronger so that there was no slacking of her speeding toward destruction the boys held desperately on to the keel saying nothing to each other but praying as best each could on the boat moved oh was there no chance of help must they go down to death in sight of so many homes a couple of hundred yards above the rapids was a floating stage strongly moored which was used by the men looking after the saw logs that came down the river in great droves from time to time as they neared this a bright thought flashed into mort's mind say boys he cried i've got it do you see that float let's push the gleam over to it the others caught the idea at once all getting on the same side of the boat they proceeded to push her toward the stage by swimming with their legs it was exhausting work but they were encouraged by seeing that they were making headway and they persevered until at last success crowned their efforts and with a glad cry of relief mort crawled upon the stage and fastened to it the boat's painter all actual danger was now over and at once mort regained his self-possession under his direction the masts were taken out the boat righted and bailed dry and everything stowed snugly aboard then with the oars she was rowed back to deschens not a whit the worst for her wetting as soon as his uncle returned mort told him the whole story mr turner was very sorry to learn of his nephew's breach of trust and as a penalty therefore withdrew from him for the rest of the summer the privilege of taking the boat out alone which was a sore deprivation but mort felt that it was richly deserved and it only strengthened his resolution to be more obedient to orders in the future end of section nineteen
Section 20 of My Strange Rescue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley. Section 20 Found After Many Days. E.D. E.D. rang out in a clear, strong voice from the door of a farmhouse, where stood a comely, brown-faced woman, shading her eyes with her right hand as she swept the sunny space around in search of her daughter. "'I'm coming, mother,' was the prompt response. And the next instant there appeared from behind the barn a little girl not more than eight years old, who looked the very picture of health and happiness. "'You know where your father's chopping today, don't you, Edie?' asked Mrs. Hazen, with a glance of affectionate pride at the sturdy little figure before her. "'Oh, yes, mother,' replied Edie, swinging around and pointing with her plump forefinger, stained by the juice of the raspberries she had just been picking, to the top of the hill that sloped upwards from the other side of the road. "'Father's over there, in the back pasture, near the blackberry patch.' "'That's right, pet.' said mrs hazen lifting up the bright face for a hearty kiss and now wouldn't you like to take him his dinner indeed i would cried edie dancing around and clapping her hands and may i stay with him until he comes home i suppose so if he wants you assented mrs hazen but in that case you must come in and have your own dinner first a half hour later with a well-filled basket on her arm and her mother's parting injunction not to loiter on the way in her ears, Edie set forth full of joy on her mission. "'She's a little thing to send so far,' mused the mother, following the retreating figure with eyes full of tender concern. "'But she does so love the woods, and seems to make her way through them like an Indian. With heart as light as any bird chirping by the wayside, Edie hastened through the gate, across the road between the lower bars of the pasture gate and then climbing the hill behind which lay the back pasture entered the bush in which her pink calico sunbonnet soon vanished from view mr hazen's farm stood on the very edge of civilization in the northern part of new brunswick the most of his acres he had cleared himself and he never lost an opportunity of hewing his way further and further into the mighty forest whose billows of birch pine and hemlock rolled away northward eastward and westward for uncounted leagues this day he was working at a bunch of timber a little beyond the eastern edge of the clearing called the back pasture as midday drew near he began to feel hungry and more than once paused in his work to go to the edge of the clearing to see if there were any signs of an approaching dinner i hope esther hasn't forgotten me today he thought after doing this for the third time to no result it's not like her to do it the great golden sun moved steadily on to the zenith and then inclined westward but still no messenger appeared bearing the needed refreshment Mr. Hazen felt strongly tempted to shoulder his axe and go home, but the day was so favourable to his work that after a good deal of grumbling at what he supposed to be his wife's neglect, he decided not to quit it. So, tightening his belt, he grasped his axe anew and strove to forget his hunger in the ardour of his toil. He did not, however, work as late as common that day, for in addition to his hunger, there grew upon him a feeling of uneasiness which at length became so disturbing that he could not endure it accordingly fully an hour before his usual time he shouldered his axe and strode off homeward saying to himself i hope nothing's gone wrong but i don't know what gives me such an apprehensive feeling when he approached the farmhouse he caught sight of his wife coming up the road that led to the nearest neighbour about half a mile away hurrying on to meet her he asked in a tone not altogether free from irritation at his needless fears why esther where have you been and where is edie 
i ran over to neighbor hewitt's for the paper mrs hazen responded but and her face filled with sudden alarm edie wasn't edie with you why no replied mr hazen while in his face was reflected the expression of his wife's i haven't seen her since breakfast not seen her repeated mrs hazen oh henry what has happened i sent her with your dinner just before midday and she asked me if she might stay with you until you came home mr hazen was a man prompt to action taking his wife's arm and fairly pushing her along the road he said there's not a moment to lose esther edie's lost her way and we must go after her without returning to the farmhouse they pressed up the hill and through the back pasture into the forest hither and thither they hunted now one now the other raising the echoes of the leafy fastness by calls of edie edie but getting no response save the cries of startled birds or the mocking chatter of a squirrel as night drew on mr hazen realized that a more organized effort was necessary and hastening home with harrowed hearts his wife got ready some food while he rode over to the hewitts to obtain assistance both mr hewitt and his eldest son returned with him they hurriedly snatched a meal and then provided with guns and lanterns set off to renew the search all that night they tramped through the gloom of the forest meeting from time to time to take counsel together and then separating to cover as much ground as possible but the day dawned without bringing any comforting news for the haggard woman who anxiously waited their return at the gate and when they came without her daughter sank down on the ground half fainting with uncontrollable grief as soon as possible the eager search was renewed and continued from day to day until at last even the heartbroken parents had to give up all hope and strove to resign themselves to the awful conviction that their darling edith their only one had met her death all alone in the depths of the great forest having either died of hunger and exposure or fallen a victim to the bears and wolves with which its solitudes abounded in the meantime how had it fared with edie who had gone forth so joyously to carry her father's dinner to him her intention at the start was certainly to make a straight course to her destination but the attention of little folks is easily attracted and in this instance just as she entered the edge of the forest and should have turned off to the left a saucy little squirrel challenged her on the right and in trying to get near him edie pushed further and further into the forest until presently she began to wonder if she had not lost her way at once losing interest in the squirrel she put down her basket to look about her with a pang of sharp dismay the child realized that she had lost her bearings and did not know which way to turn just at that moment her keen ear caught a sound that she immediately recognized it was the regular blows of an axe falling upon a tree trunk her face lit up and she clapped her hands for joy that's father chopping she exclaimed now i know which way to go and picking up her basket edie trotted off in what she took to be the direction from which the sound came on she trudged bravely for some distance hoping each minute to come upon her father until growing weary of her burden she put it down to rest a moment as she rested it seemed to her that the sound of chopping had grown fainter so much so indeed she could hardly make out which way it came to her ears oh dear she sighed where can father be i'll call for him and she made the place ring with shrill cries of father father where are you but they evoked no response and then more alarmed than ever edie picked up her basket again and pushed on with all her little strength unhappily every step increased the distance between mr hazen and herself for it was not the real sound of the chopping edie had followed but the echo and instead of making toward him she had been going in directly the opposite direction at the end of an hour she felt very tired and throwing herself down on a bank of moss 
at the foot of a forest monarch she gave way to the tears that hitherto she had resolutely restrained oh dear she said i'm lost i'm lost and how ever will father find me after the first passion of tears had passed edie began to be conscious of the pangs of hunger and the thought came that she might as well eat something out of the basket as she could not find her father to give it to him so she ate a little of the bread and meat and took a sup out of the bottle of milk and then feeling refreshed renewed her tramp first listening eagerly but in vain for the sound of her father's axe all that afternoon the lost child alternately walked and rested often crying softly to herself then drying her tears and seeking to take heart from the hope of yet finding her father before darkness came on she was a brave little thing accustomed to a good deal of outdoor life and to running through the woods but when night closed around her and the forest shade deepened into impenetrable gloom poor edie gave up the struggle and sank down in a mossy hollow shivering with terror yet so weary was she that presently she fell asleep and did not awake until dawn when though feeling very stiff and sore from the unwonted exertions of the day before she ate her breakfast out of the basket and renewed her progress the following day she wandered about only getting deeper and deeper into the forest her basket was empty before evening and she was fain to make her supper of the berries which fortunately were very plentiful they were not altogether satisfying but they were better than nothing another day passed the weather providentially continuing bright clear and warm and the little wanderer still kept on not knowing whither she was going that night strange things began to happen she was more wakeful than usual and as she lay at the foot of a tree she saw some large animals moving about in the dim light and her bosom thrilled with joy for she thought they must be her father's oxen so she called out buck bright come here but at the sound of her voice they started as if greatly frightened and at once dashed off through the woods at the top of their speed which showed her that they must have been moose such as her father sometimes shot the following night two great black shaggy dogs which she supposed must be neighbor hewitt's came near her but when she called them by their names they seemed more surprised than the moose for they stood up on their hind legs looked very hard at her for a few moments and then dropping down on all fours hastened away into the darkness again whereas edie thought she heard them howling in this however she must have been doubly mistaken what she took to be dogs were no doubt black bears then quite numerous in that district being attracted by the berries and the howling of course was done by wolves which luckily seemed afraid to attack her on the fourth afternoon edie by happy chance came across the deserted shanty of an early pioneer standing in the middle of a clearing that was thickly overgrown with raspberry bushes here she remained for three days feeding upon the berries during the daytime and sleeping in the shanty at night the nights were so warm that she needed no fire and inside the shanty she was safe from the attacks of bears or wolves it was dreadfully lonely yet still she hoped that her father would come and find her a whole week thus passed away edie had been given up for lost by her heartbroken parents and the neighbors who were assisting in the search had returned to their homes when a gentleman mr barker by name had an experience such as no sportsman surely ever had before he had been out on a hunting expedition for a fortnight and that day he came to the banks of bear creek he was preparing to cross on a fallen log almost spanning the stream when his keen ear caught the sound of soft footsteps accompanied by a continuous rustling movement in the thicket of the wild raspberries that covered the opposite bank at once with a tremor of delight he suspected the approach of a deer or possibly a bear and dropping behind a bush 
he leveled his rifle in readiness to fire the next moment as his eager eyes intently scanned the raspberry bushes his sportsman's feeling of delight suddenly changed to a thrill of horror when a tiny brown berry-stained hand was quietly raised to pull down a loaded branch of fruit well of all things cried the hunter as his finger fell from the trigger that had so nearly spent the bullet upon its fatal mission what an awful mistake i almost made throwing down his rifle he sprang across the log to catch in his arms a little girl not more than eight years old whose torn garments tangled locks soiled hands and thin pale face told in a glance the story of many days hapless wanderings oh how glad poor edie was to see him and how artlessly she told the story of her wonderful adventures and how thankful to providence the hunter was that he had chanced to find her ere it was too late forgetting all about his hunting her rescuer now applied himself to the task of getting her home they were far from the nearest house and the poor child was so weak from lack of proper food that he had to lift her up on his broad shoulders but mr barker was as strong as he was kind-hearted and he pushed resolutely on guiding himself by his compass until at last just as dusk was closing around them and he began to fear they would have to pass another night in the forest they came upon a clearing at the far side of which stood a neat log house edie shouted her joy at the sight it meant that all her perils were over and the hunter putting on a big spurt dashed across the clearing at a run and deposited her on the doorstep exclaiming in a tone of vast relief there now my child that's the end of your wanderings the good people of the house gave them both a warm welcome edie received every attention and the following morning looking altogether a different girl with dress mended hair neatly brushed hands free from berry stains and face radiant at the prospect of returning to her parents she took her seat in the farmer's wagon to be driven home how shall the joy of the hazens be described when the little daughter they had mourned for as dead came back to them looking thin and worn it is true but otherwise not a whit the worse for her thrilling experience mr barker watched them with brimming eyes murmuring as he fondly patted the stock of his remington the best day's work you ever did was when you didn't go off at all a lucky chance indeed End of section 20。section 21 of My Strange Rescue。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Myra Parker. My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley. Section 21. Mrs. Grundy's Gobblers. Mrs. Grundy, or as the boys disrespectfully called her, Mrs. Grumpy, was certainly not a favorite with the young people of Westville. In the first place, she did not like children. The fact that she had never been blessed with any of her own, no doubt, had a great deal to do with this dislike for other people's, which she manifested by vigorous use of hand and tongue at the slightest provocation many a sharp speech and stinging slap did mrs grundy inflict and not always upon those who deserved it most either for so hot was her temper so hasty her action when irritated that she would visit her wrath upon the first youngster she could reach without waiting to investigate the extent of her luckless captive's guilt another reason why mrs grundy was not popular was that although she owned the finest orchard and garden in all westville not one crimson strawberry purple plum or golden apple was she ever known to bestow upon boy or girl and woe betide the adventurous urchin that dared to take one unbidden even though it be a half-spoiled windfall if he fell into her strong hands forthwith he was marched off amid a storm of slaps and scolding despite his sobs and vows of penitence into the awful presence of squire hardgrit and his alarmed parents having been duly summoned was in their presence condemned to that most appalling of punishments a whole day in the house of detention 
this method of dealing with the would-be or actual fruit vultures had one advantage so far as mrs grundy was concerned it gave her a sharer in the burden of her unpopularity which perhaps might otherwise have proved insupportable for so hard cold and unsympathetic was squire hardgrit and such evident pleasure did he take in imposing his penalties that if the westville boys hated anybody as cordially as they did mrs grundy it was certainly the stern severe squire for some time past the relations between these two worthies and the boys had as the newspapers say about the great powers been more than usually strained not content with fiercely defending her garden and orchard from juvenile depredation mrs grundy had asserted her right to keep everybody off the broad smooth plot of grass that lay between her cottage and the road and had been upheld in her claim by the squire to the profound disgust of the boys who had long made it their gathering place in the summer evenings for although too small to play a game of baseball upon it was big enough for pitching and catching chase leapfrog and that sort of thing this appropriation of the grass plot which had hitherto been regarded as public property was quite too much for the boys it was the last drop in the cup of bitterness and in desperation they called a meeting to be held in thompson's barn on saturday night to consider the situation saturday night came and a dozen of the brightest boys of westville gathered in solemn conclave around a lantern to see if some way could not be devised of getting even with mrs grumpy and the squire as the barn belonged to his father charlie thompson was chosen chairman and he promptly opened the meeting as follows now fellows we can't stand this sort of thing any longer something must be done if we perish in the attempt the honor of the country demands charlie whose memory was particularly good had not yet forgotten the last fourth of july oration that measures should be taken to show our oppressors that we are not slaves and cowards the meeting is now open and the chair will be pleased to receive suggestions and amid a vigorous round of boot-heel applause charlie sat down feeling that he had proved himself quite equal to the occasion for a few moments there was a dead pause all having some sort of scheme more or less hazy in their heads but none wishing to speak first at last little tommy short the youngest in the group piped out let's tar and feather em father has lots of tar in his back shop and i know where there's a big pot a roar of laughter greeted this suggestion the impracticability of which was exceeded only by its absurdity could it have been carried out dame grundy and squire hardgrit would certainly have made a most mirth-provoking sight done up in suits of tar and feathers the speech served its purpose however in loosening the other tongues and plans and projects now poured in thick and fast suppose we burn their barns down said dick wilding who was a great reader of cheap novel literature but all the rest shouted no at once what do you say to hamstringing their horses asked bob henderson in rather a dubious tone as if he had not much confidence in the wisdom of his scheme which in fact just occurred to him because he had read that that was the way the arabs treat their enemies horses when they get the chance stuff and nonsense cried the chairman that's not the sort of thing we mean at all we're not hankering after the penitentiary give us your plan then mr chairman said dick wilding well fellows i'll tell you what i was thinking of let us hook the old lady's gobblers and hide them until she thinks they're gone for good you know what a heap she thinks of them and it will worry her awfully to lose them capital capital shouted the rest of the boys the very thing but where shall we hide them asked sam lawson it'll have to be a pretty safe place for mrs grumpy will turn the town upside down hunting for her precious turkeys you may be sure while all this talk was going on harold kent had been sitting on an upturned box which served him as a chair without opening his mouth now however taking advantage of the pause which followed sam's question he said quietly why not hide the gobblers in one of the empty rooms in squire hardgrit's building you know the squire's been trying to get these bronze gobblers from mrs grumpy for ever so long and she won't let him have them and if they're found on his premises she'll be sure to think that he had something to do with hooking them it was just like harold to propose something so original and daring in its conception as to fairly take his companion's breath away and they now looked at him with feelings divided between admiration 
and amazement. The chairman was the first to speak. Bringing his hand down upon his knee with a crack that made the others jump, he cried, Magnificent! Boys will do it, or perish in the attempt! Whereat the others shouted in chorus, Hurrah! We'll do it! since we're all agreed then said charlie the next business before the meeting is to plan how to do it as before all sorts of wild suggestions were put forward and again it was left for harold kent to advance the most practicable scheme this was it the shed in which mrs grundy's famous flock of turkeys was carefully secured at night stood at some distance to the back of her house and as she slept in one of the front rooms there was slight risk of her seeing or hearing anything what harold proposed was that slipping out of their rooms after everybody was asleep they should meet behind the turkey shed bringing with them three gunny sacks and a dark lantern having got the gobbler safely into the sacks they would then creep round the back way to the building in which the squire's office was situated climb in through a lower window and so upstairs to the room in which the turkeys were to be left you've a great head hal said jack wilding admiringly when all this had been detailed and you can count on us every time canny boys you bet he can chorused the crowd a satisfactory plan of campaign having thus been settled upon the meeting was adjourned until monday midnight then to assemble behind mrs grundy's turkey shed the eventful night came and as midnight drew near one by one the boys gathered with throbbing hearts at the rendezvous at length all but tommy short whose courage had failed him and bob henderson whose father had nabbed him in the act of slipping out and sent him back to bed with the spank turned up it was an intensely dark night and blowing half a gale all of which was in favor of the enterprise the shed door was found to be simply secured with a wooden latch, and lifting this, the conspirators tiptoed inside, and then Charlie Thompson, who carried the dark lantern, suddenly turned its full glare upon the startled gobblers as they nodded solemnly side by side upon their roost. They were too bewildered by the blaze to make any noise, and before they could recover their self-possession sufficiently to exclaim at so extraordinary an apparition, the other boys had stepped behind them and with quick, deft movements slipped the big sacks over their heads, thus reducing them at one bold stroke to helpless captives. The poor turkeys struggled and gobbled a good deal in their narrow quarters, but all to no purpose, and full of terror, no doubt, at their strange treatment, were hurried out of the shed into the lane and thence through dark and silent ways to the rear of the squire's building here the conspirators paused for breath and consultation now fellows whispered harold kent we needn't all go inside you know i'll take the lantern while the three biggest of you carry the gobblers and the rest will stay here until we come back somewhat reluctantly this was assented to for all wanted to share the danger as well as the fun and then harold lantern in hand followed by dick wilding sam shaw and frank cushing each bending beneath a bag of struggling gobbling turkey climbed in through the low window crept softly in stocking feet along the narrow hall and up the creaking stairs while their companions with hearts beating like trip hammers shrank close together in the darkest corner outside and anxiously awaited their return it was no easy task that the four boys had in hand true enough that the building was uninhabited at night but there were people living next door and any unusual noise could hardly fail to be heard through those thin wooden walls while late as the hour was the sound of footsteps on the plank sidewalks would ever and anon send a chill of terror through the anxious watchers below moreover to carry three big turkeys up a flight of stairs and deposit them in an empty room without filling the whole place with their noise was the hardest part of all nevertheless they succeeded admirably five minutes after they disappeared they rejoined their companions trembling but triumphant having left their captives in good order and condition in the front room just across the room from squire hardgrit's office where they would be certain to make themselves seen and heard in the morning 
this done the boys scattered to their homes creeping back noiselessly to their beds in which being thoroughly tired out they slept as soundly until morning as if they had not been up to any mischief whatever the great gathering place of the westville boys was the blacksmith's forge which stood across the road from mrs grundy's and thither the conspirators came one by one the following morning in expectation of seeing the fun nor were they disappointed their enemy thought too much of her precious turkeys to entrust any person else with the duty of feeding them and so every morning carried them a big dish of cornmeal mush after she had finished her own breakfast there she goes exclaimed dick wilding presently as the boys were laughing and talking somewhat nervously together and sure enough mrs grundy's portly figure emerged from the house and went slowly toward the shed soon after a sharp cry of susan susan cut the still morning air and the prim maid-servant was observed to hurry to her mistress a moment later the two women could be observed running hither and thither through the garden and orchard calling turkey 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 at the top of their voices great indeed was mrs grundy's concern and soon the whole neighborhood was made aware of her loss it's those rascally gypsies sure's i'm alive she cried who else would steal my beautiful gobblers that i wouldn't sell even to the squire i'll have every one of them sent to jail see if i don't just wait till the squire comes and so she stormed while waiting the arrival of the squire at his office the moment he appeared she poured her woeful tale into his ears while a curious crowd gathered outside eager to see what the majesty of the law could effect most prominent in the crowd were of course the boys who alone held the clue to the mystery and were now eagerly expecting the grand denouement it was not long in coming mrs grundy had only about half finished her confused recital of facts suspicions and theories to the gravely listening squire when a vigorous gobble 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 was distinctly heard coming from somewhere near at hand just as a shout broke in from the street of there they are up in squire hardgrit's room look at them before the squire could take in the situation his excited client sprang to her feet rushed out of the office across the hall threw open the door into the opposite room and there behold as large as life and as cross as three gobblers could be were her missing turkeys who the instant the door was open charged straight through it almost upsetting their mistress and went flapping violently downstairs and out into the street where they were greeted with a shout of laughter from the surprised spectators it would be impossible with either pen or pencil to give an adequate conception of the old lady's countenance as she returned to the squire's office and met that worthy magistrate just rising from his chair surprise suspicion indignation and wrath chased one another swiftly across her features and once her feelings found utterance there was poured upon the amazed squire such a torrent of reproach and contumely that he was fairly stunned into silence before he could recover himself sufficiently to make his defense his accuser with a scornful swing of her ample skirts that was simply magnificent flounced out of the office while he sank back into his chair the very picture of helpless bewilderment that he squire hardgrit the incorruptible guardian of the people's rights should be suspected of having stolen or causing to have stolen for him the turkeys of a neighbor whose situation as a lone widow was such as to make the crime seem particularly heinous that any person should for one moment suspect anything so abominable and not only suspect it but charge him to his face with his supposed guilt before the whole village for the squire was well aware that mrs grundy's shrill utterances had been audible clear across the street it was awful perfectly awful and not to be borne for a moment he must see mrs grundy immediately and compel her to listen to him accordingly away he posted to the widow's cottage where he arrived just in time to check the poor dame from going off into a fit of hysterics her turkeys being once more safely in her yard and her anger pretty well abated mrs grundy was quite willing to listen believingly to the squire's indignant denials and graciously accept his assurance that no pains would be spared to ferret out the real delinquents 
the former harmony was restored and an alliance offensive and defensive sealed with a glass of gooseberry wine for both were strongly of the opinion that those wicked wretches of boys were at the bottom of the whole mischief thanks to those same boys holding their tongues however neither mrs grundy nor the squire could ever get hold on any evidence more solid than their own suspicions and they both had too much sense to take any action upon them but the nocturnal travels of the turkeys were not in vain for their mistress realizing that the boys if pressed too far might do something worse next time thought it wise to mitigate her severity toward them and even softened to the extent of calling a lot of them into her orchard that very autumn to fill their pockets with the windfalls this stroke of diplomacy was not lost upon the boys who reciprocated after their own fashion and thus matters went smoothly on until at length most harmonious relations were established and in all the countryside no creatures were safer from the youngsters mischief than mrs grundy's gobblers end of section twenty one recording by myra parker Section 22 of My Strange Rescue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Myra Parker. My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley. Section 22. On the Wrong Side of the Snow Ridge. One of the fur commissioners of the Hudson Bay Company at Winnipeg was entertaining a number of the factors and other officials at Christmas dinner, and after the successive courses had received appreciative attention, the guests settled themselves at ease about the table to enjoy the excellent cigars and one another's conversation. Made up as the gathering was of men who had for ten, twenty, thirty years or longer, in the pursuance of their vocation, experienced most moving adventures by flood and field, good stories followed fast. One told of a thrilling trip through the dangerous rapids of the portage of the drowned, another of the narrow escape from meeting death at the hands of a grizzly among the foothills of the Rockies, while a third held the attention of all as he graphically described the fearful struggle that he had with a wounded bull bison in the valley of the Bow River. Thus the storytelling went around, until it reached Hugh Mackenzie, one of the oldest officials in the active service, who, in response to a unanimous demand, spun the following interesting yarn of mountain sheep hunting. It was in the third year of my clerkship, and they had sent me away out to Fort George, right in the heart of the Rockies i would rather have stayed on the plains where the buffalo were in plenty but you're not asked as to what you'd like best in the company you're just told to go and there's an end of it i found it very dull at fort george and to while away the time i did all the hunting i could to help me in this i had two fine dogs of whom i was extremely proud they were half-bred collies not particularly handsome creatures but full of pluck and as knowing animals as ever wagged tails having had pretty good luck with bear and other game to be found in the neighborhood of the fort i became possessed of a strong desire to secure the head of one of those rocky mountain sheep which have their home high up among the peaks and are as difficult animals to hunt as there are in the world again and again i went out without success although my dogs bruce and oscar seemed as eager to get sheep as i was myself but instead of becoming disheartened i grew all the more determined and longed for the winter to come when the snow by covering their higher pasturing grounds would drive the sheep lower down the mountain and thus make them more gettable the winter began with the series of heavy snowfalls which shut us all up in the fort for several weeks and it was early in december before i thought it safe to have another try after the sheep then one fine bright morning i started off feeling very hopeful that i would return with my much coveted prize the dogs of course went with me but i had no other companion nobody else having sufficient sporting ardor to share in the risks of my expedition for it certainly was full of risks and had i been older and wiser i would never have undertaken it but i was young and strong and full of spirit and my eagerness to obtain a set of horns had become a bit of a joke against me with the fellows so that i was not in the mood to soberly weigh the pros and cons of the matter 
Thinking it possible I might be out all night, I rolled up some provisions and matches in my thick plaid and strapped it on my shoulders. With hatchet and hunting knife in my belt, a full powder horn at my side, snowshoes on feet, and rifle in hand, I set out amid the good-humored chaffing of my fellow clerks. Up into the mountains I climbed, keeping a keen lookout for signs of the game I was seeking, while Bruce and Oscar ranged right and left, so that we covered a good deal of ground between us. By midday the climbing became so steep and difficult that I had to take off my snowshoes and strap them on my back. They were no longer necessary at any rate, for the snow was covered with a crust which bore me up admirably and made easy going for my moccasined feet. It was not until afternoon that the first sheep were sighted, and much to my delight they seemed not far away and easy to get at. There were five in the flock, a huge ram with superb horns, just the thing I hankered after, and four fine ewes, which, however, had nothing to fear from me. Calling the dogs to heel, I proceeded to stalk the unsuspecting creatures with all the skill I possessed. It proved a harder job than I thought. They were on a kind of ledge several hundred feet above me, and in order to get a proper shot without giving them warning, it was necessary to make a wide circuit so as to reach a point opposite their ledge from which a capital chance might be had. By dint of great exertion, however, I reached the point all right and was just waiting a moment to catch my breath before taking aim at the ram when Oscar's impatience overcame him and he gave a sharp bark. Instantly, the whole live animal started to flee. I threw the rifle to my shoulder and pulled the trigger. It was nothing better than a snap shot, yet it did not miss, for with the report the ram sprang into the air, stumbled as he came down, and then dashed off again, leaving behind him a plain trail of blood drops in the white snow. With an exultant shout, I sent the dogs forward and followed as fast as I could. I had to go down into a ravine and get up the other side before reaching the bloody trail. Forgetting everything else in my wild excitement, I pressed on, guided by my dog's sharp barking. It was terribly hard work, and I had many a slip and stumble, but the red splashes in the snow grew larger the further I went. Bleeding at the rate he was, the ram surely could not keep up his flight for any great distance. Presently, I came to a place that at any other time would have brought me to a full stop. A ridge of hard frozen snow stretched between two rocky ledges. On the one side, it reached down the edge of a precipice, which then fell away abruptly into an unknown depth. On the other side, in one unbroken sheet, it sloped down full 500 feet to a level upon which the snow lay in great drifts. The ram was already halfway across the ridge, although evidently in distress, and the dogs were hard at his heel, barking fiercely, for they knew that victory was not far off. Throwing all considerations of prudence to the winds, I set out to follow them. So narrow was the ridge that I could not stand erect, but had to sit astride it and push myself forward by using both hands and feet. I never glanced below me, lest I should lose my head, and at length, almost completely exhausted, I succeeded in making the other side. Here awaiting me was my quarry, standing at bay against the cliff and butting off the dogs that were springing for his throat. It was some minutes before my nerves were sufficiently steadied for me to use my rifle, then one shot was sufficient. With a convulsive spring, the noble animal scattered the dogs and fell dead at my feet. Oh, but what a proud moment for me. The horns were splendid. A man might not get a finer pair in a lifetime. With the utmost care, I detached the head, and then, for the first time since the chase began, sat down to rest. I was so tired that I would have been glad to camp here for the night, but there was absolutely nothing in the way of shelter, and it promised to be bitterly cold and windy. I must get back to the lower level before darkness came on. Securing the ram's head on my shoulders, where I must say it felt abominably heavy, I returned to the ridge. Not until then did I realize into what a critical position my reckless ardor had brought me. One look at that perilous passageway was sufficient to assure me that in my wearied and unnerved condition to recross it was a feat utterly impracticable. My dogs, two clever, sure-footed creatures as they were, shrank back in evident dismay. Although I sought to urge them forward, yet for me to remain on that exposed ledge meant death by freezing before morning. 
i was in a terrible predicament little more than an hour of daylight remained whatever was to be done needed to be done right away while i stood there bewildered and irresolute oscar again ventured out a little distance on the ridge but becoming frightened tried to turn back in so doing he lost his footing and despite desperate efforts to regain it shot swiftly down the slope that ended in a level five hundred feet below with keen concern i watched him through the waning light rolling helplessly over and over until after a final tumble he landed in a great drift out of which to my great joy he emerged the next moment shook himself vigorously and sent back a brisk bark as though to say come along it's not as bad as it looks instantly i caught the idea if my dog made the descent uninjured why could not i great as the risk might be it was after all no worse than staying on the ledge all night to think was to act loosening the ram's head from my back i sent it down after oscar it sped to the bottom and buried itself in a snowbank next i tied my rifle hatchet and hunting knife on one of the snowshoes and dispatched them they too made the trip all right and vanished in the snow then came my turn rolling up the plaid i lashed it on the remaining snowshoe and committed myself to this extemporized toboggan what followed is more than i can tell so steep was the slope that i seemed to drop into space i was not conscious of touching anything but simply of being shot through the icy air blinded by particles of snow and choking for lack of breath until i was hurled like a stone from a catapult into a mass of loosely packed snow and lost consciousness when i came to myself bruce and oscar were both beside me licking my face with affectionate anxiety at first i could not move and my whole body was so full of pain that i feared i had been seriously injured but after lying still a while i made shift to get upon my feet and to my vast relief found myself none the worse of my wild descent save for a scratched face and a severe shaking my next thought was for the horns i had no difficulty in extricating them or the rifle from their snowy bed and found both were uninjured strapping them once more on my shoulders and adjusting my snowshoes i set off down the ravine to get back to the fort that evening was of course out of the question but i hoped to find some cavity in the cliff where i could spend the night safely just before dark i discovered a snug little place perfectly protected from the wind and there with my plaid wrapped tight around me and my dogs curled up close against me i put in quite a comfortable night as soon as the day broke i started for the fort and reached it by noon half starved and very tired but as proud of my trophy as david was of goliath's head a hearty round of applause followed the conclusion of the old scotchman's story and by general consent it was voted the best told during the evening end of section twenty two recording by myra parker Section 23 of My Strange Rescue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Florence Short. My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley. Section 23 Through the Trackless Forest. The two features of nature in which her might, her majesty, her mystery find fullest expression are the ocean and the forest. Regarding their vastness and their unchanging character, in our weak endeavor to find terms for the infinite, we have made them symbols of eternity. Irresistible, perennial is the fascination they possess for man, and ill satisfying the measure with which they respond to his demands on ocean's bosom or in the forest's heart he finds free play for his noblest qualities in making them subservient to his will he has achieved his grandest development nowhere round the globe are the forests finer than on this continent of ours boundless in extent and endless in diversity the eye never wearies of resting upon them or seeking to penetrate their depths happily free as they are from the dense matted undergrowth 
that makes progress through the forests of the tropics a continuous penitential pilgrimage they present glorious vistas of sylvan shade shot through with golden shafts of sunlight down which you may wander at your ease in unchecked communion with nature by way of comparison just place these two pictures side by side seeking to give some conception of the interminable congo forest in which he spent so many months of misery stanley exclaims take a thick scottish copse dripping with rain imagine this copse to be a mere undergrowth nourished under the impenetrable shade of ancient trees ranging from one hundred feet to one hundred and eighty feet high briars and thorns abundant lazy creeks meandering through the depths of the jungle and sometimes a deep affluent of a great river imagine this forest and jungle in all stages of decay and growth old trees fallen leaning perilously over fallen prostrate ants and insects of all kinds sizes and colors murmuring around monkeys and chimpanzees above queer noises of birds and animals crashes in the jungle as troops of elephants rush away rain pattering down on you every other day in the year an impure atmosphere with its dread consequences fever and dysentery gloom throughout the day and darkness almost palpable throughout the night turn now to parkman who knows and loves his forests as miss murfrey her mountains and who has once and for all time painted the picture of the great american forest deep recesses where veiled in foliage some wild shy rivulet steals with timid music through breathless caves of verdure gulfs where feathered crags rise like castle walls where the noonday sun pierces with keen rays athwart the torrent and the mossed arms of fallen pines cast wandering shadows on the illumined foam pools of liquid crystal turned emerald in the reflected green of impending woods rocks on whose rugged front the gleam of sunlit waters dances in quivering light ancient trees hurled headlong by the storm to dam the raging stream with their forlorn and savage ruin or the stern depths of immemorial forests dim and silent as a cavern columned with innumerable trunks each like an atlas upholding its world of leaves and sweating perpetual moisture down its dark and channeled rind some strong in youth some gouty with decrepit age nightmares of strange distortion gnarled and knotted with winds and goiters roots entwined beneath like serpents petrified in an agony of contorted strife green and glistening mosses carpeting the rough ground mantling the rocks turning pulpy stumps to mounds of verdure and swathing fallen trunks as bent in the impotence of rottenness they lie outstretched over knoll and hollow like mouldering reptiles of the primeval world while around and on and through them springs the young growth that fattens on their decay the forest devouring its own dead or to turn from its funereal shade to the light and life to the open woodland the sheen of sparkling lakes and mountains basking in the glory of the summer noon flecked by the shadows of passing clouds that sail on snowy wings across the transparent azure no pestilent fever or insidious deadly miasma lurks in our forests on the contrary their pure piney breath brings back health to many an ailing mortal and beneath their feathery hemlocks and aromatic spruces one may lie down at night in sweet security from snakes or centipedes or other crawling horrors that make each night in a tropical forest a period of peril is there one of us recalling the life of the coureur de bois the men who above all others made the trackless forest their own does not feel a stirring of the pulses of the admiration and envy and a pathetic regret that those romantic days in which they flourished are over for ever
they were the natural outcome of the beaver trade which in the earliest stage of canadian history formed the struggling french colony's chief source of support all that was most active and vigorous in the colony took to the woods thereby escaping from the oppressive control of intendants councils and priests to the savage freedom of the wilderness not only were the possible profits great but in the pursuit of them there was a fascinating element of adventure and danger which irresistibly appeals to the spirit of enterprise and daring that civilization has not yet quite extinguished within our breasts though not a very valuable member of society and a thorn in the side of princes and rulers the coureur de bois had his uses at least from an artistic point of view and his strange figure sometimes brutally savage but oftener marked with the lines of a daredevil courage and a reckless thoughtless gaiety will always be joined to the memories of that grand world of woods which the nineteenth century is fast civilizing out of existence lost in the forest what a thrill runs swift to the heart as we repeat the words ever since our young eyes overflowed at the immortal legend of the babes in the wood sleeping the sleep that knew no awakening beneath the leafy winding sheet brought them by their bird mourners we seem to have had a clear conception of all the terrors the phrase implies and we follow with throbbing pulses and bated breath the recital of such an experience as the foremost and noblest of all the pioneers of these north american forests had one eventful autumn nearly three centuries ago champlain had caught sight of a strange-looking bird and left his party to go in pursuit flitting from tree to tree the bird lured him deeper and deeper into the forest then took wing and vanished on essaying to retrace his steps champlain found himself at a loss whither should he turn the day was clouded and he had left his compass in camp the forest closed around him trees mingled with trees in lee and lost he wandered all day and at night slept fasting at the foot of a great tree awaking chilled and faint he walked until afternoon then happily found a pond upon whose bosom were waterfowl some of which he shot and for the first time broke his fast kindling a fire he prepared his supper and lay down to sleep in a drenching rain another day of blind and weary wandering succeeded and another night of exhaustion he found paths in the wilderness but they had not been made by human feet after a time the tinkling of a brook touched his ear and he determined to follow its course in the hope that it would lead him to the river where his party was encamped with toilsome steps he traced the infant stream now lost beneath the decaying masses of fallen trunks or the impervious intricacies of matted windfalls now stealing through swampy thickets or gurgling in the shade of rocks till it entered at length not into the river but into a small lake circling around the brink he found the point where gliding among clammy roots of elders the brook ran out and resumed its course pressing persistently forward he at length forced his way out of the entanglement of underbrush into an open meadow and there before him rolled the river broad and turbulent its bank marked with the portage path by which the indians passed the neighboring rapids the good god be praised he had found the clue he sought inexpressibly relieved he hastened along the riverside and in a few hours more was being joyfully welcomed by his companions who had been anxiously searching for him from that day forth we are told his host durantel would never suffer him to go into the forest alone although the coureur de bois has long since made his exit there still remains in canada a class of men who have somewhat in common with him these are lumber scouts or bush rangers whose business it is to seek for limits that will pay handsome profits it is boards not beavers they have upon their minds 
they are often indians or half-breeds and the skill of these self-taught surveyors is sometimes very remarkable they will explore the length and breadth of the terra incognita and report upon the kind and value of its timber the situation and capability of its streams for floating out the logs and the facilities for hauling and transportation they will even map out the surface of the country showing the position of its streams and lakes its groves of timber and its mountainous or level appearance with the skill and accuracy bewildering to ordinary mortals in whose eyes the whole district would be one great confused wilderness no more interesting experience in woodcraft could be had than a scouting excursion in such company the trackless forest has no terrors no mysteries for them to them nature opens her heart and tells all her secrets in lightest marching order each man's entire equipment being carried in a shoulder pack upheld by a tump line around the forehead they plunge into the wilderness with unerring instinct they pursue their way now following the course of some winding stream now circling a tiny lake lying gem-like in a virtuous setting now scrambling among cliffs where to paraphrase parkman seeing but unseen the crouched wildcat eyes them from the thicket now threading a maze of water-girded rocks which the white cedar and the spruce clasp with serpent-like roots then diving into leafy depths where the rock maple rears its green masses the beech its glistening leaves and clear smooth stem while behind stiff and somber stands the balsam fir and the white pine towers proudly over all when night falls they make their simple bivouac and their roaring campfire like a magician's wand strangely transforms the scene as the flame casts its keen red light around wild forms stand forth against the outer gloom the oak a giant in rusty mail the mighty pyramid of the pine the wan and ghastly birch looking like a spectre in the darkness the campers gather close around the ruddy flame made welcome by the cool breath of approaching autumn and after the broiled trout or roast duck have disappeared and an incense offering a fragrant smoke ascended from their pipes they curl up in their blankets and sleep as only those who live such a life can sleep serenely oblivious of the harsh shriek of the owl the mournful howl of the wolf or the soft footfall of some prowling beast that breaks in upon the breathless stillness splendid as our forests are at midsummer when the delighted eye roams unweariedly over their billowing expanses of sumptuous verdure it is in the autumn time that they reach their rarest beauty then for a brief space before they strip themselves of their foliage to stand bare and shivering through the long cold winter they change their garb of green into a myriad of hues of gold and flame a keen frosty night following upon a decline of summer heat and lo as though some mighty magician had been at work a marvellous transformation awaits our admiration where yesterday a single colour in various tints prevailed to-day we behold every possible shade of brilliant scarlet tender violet sombre brown vivid crimson and glittering yellow the beech the birch the oak and above all the maple have burst forth into one harmonious and entrancing chorus of colour the swan song of the dying foliage the stern straight fir alone maintaining its eternal green as if it said behold in me the symbol of steadfastness verily the wide world round a more splendid and enchanting sylvan panorama cannot be found end of section twenty three